Hi, I'm Gigi Duban, and on this episode of Alabama Inc., we're following around one group that just won't quit trying to get the Birmingham Hammers, a would-be pro soccer team, off the ground. Pat Duggins chats with sports retail superstar Jeff Rosenthal, CEO of Hibbit Sports. And Richard Burton of Burton & Associates stops by to talk with Josh about tips for dealing with lawyers. He tells you who to call first if you get locked up. It's not your mom. It's coming up next on Alabama Inc. Alabamians are nuts about sports. College football, can't get enough. Baseball, basketball, great. Even soccer's fan base is getting big here. One group thinks that's the precursor to a pro team. Meet the folks behind the Birmingham Hammers. Volunteers love pizza, and this group is no different. They're doing the usual, stuffing envelopes, folding scarves. Oh, and they're hatching this plan to get a sports team off the ground. Right now, the team doesn't actually exist. So, but Birmingham Hammers is not an actual team yet. Key word in that sentence was? Yet. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good, yep. So, yet. So. Our efforts, like we said, we got the inspiration from the group in Indy, you know, and they went five years without actually getting a franchise. We don't think it's going to take us that long. We're further along than they are at this point. After only a year, people have already asked us about, you know, potentially investing. So we have a few people lined up that are, you know, they, they just kind of want to see what's going to be happening. They're taking a grassroots approach. Right now, questions like, where would this team play? Or how are you going to pay your players? These are things they'll figure out later. Right now, they're just getting people excited about the idea of a pro team. People ask, not just you, people ask, where are you guys gonna play? Where's your money? Uh, we're starting the discussion. We're, we're a year old. Um, it has to start somewhere. He's referenced the Indian, what's happened in Indiana. It took them five years to get that conversation going. So we feel, um, why wait? We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the investors. But let's get that process going now. So maybe in a year, we do have a couple investors. Maybe in two years, there are plans from a city to potentially um, supplement some type of field or stadium. It's all building up to one big event an exhibition match between the UAB men's soccer team and the Atlanta Silverbacks. The guys figure if enough people show up for this match, why wouldn't they come out to support a pro soccer team in Birmingham? You've been planning this event for probably, what, a couple months? About a couple months, yeah. Right, right around the end of January. Um, Middle January, we got the final word from Atlanta that said they were going to agree to come over to play the game. And so since then, it's just been phone call here, phone call there, meeting here, meeting there, just trying to tie up all the loose ends and you know make sure everybody uh, knows about it and can come. The, the idea is you know to prove to any possible investors or leagues or people who want to build a venue, whether it be the city or private funds, that professional soccer is sustainable in Birmingham. So. If we get a big enough crowd out, it's, that's the bigger idea is can we bring a professional team to Birmingham and would it be more than just you know a, a passing fancy of the city? Will they stay? Will it be something sustainable that we can be proud of for a long time? The showdown happens at UAB. The guys behind the Birmingham Hammers did a lot of marketing. Now they're really hoping for a good turnout. When the gates first open, no one's there. It's still early for kickoff, but it's enough to make the guys behind the Birmingham Hammers a little worried. The 
The teams get there, they start warming up, and then the crowds arrive. First in a trickle, then they're lined up into the street to buy tickets. There are people from all over the state, like this Birmingham Hammers fan from Lincoln, Alabama. Because uh, I want to see professional sports here, especially professional soccer. Do you think uh, what they're doing here has a pretty good chance of success? I really hope so. I mean, I, 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 want, I want to see it here, I want to support it, and uh, I, I want it here so I can have something to cheer on. Local, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have to cheer on something that's, you know, across the pond. From the start of the game right now. We are 15 minutes away, 15 minutes away from first kick. All right, and, how are we um, looking? We're looking pretty good. The crowd's starting to fill out. We got a line across the street. Uh, people are starting to show up. It's, uh, it's a good feeling. I'm buzzing right now. Went out on a ledge. People are coming out to support us, and it feels good. So. By the time kickoff rolls around, the stands are packed, and fans are buying tons of Birmingham Hammers merchandise. Move the ball, boys! Move the ball! Let's go! Hammers! Hammers! What, I mean, of all the things that you did ahead of the match to get people pumped about it, to let people know about it, what do you think had the most impact? You know, it's, it's really a combination of everything. I mean, we've had street teams all over Birmingham for the past few weeks. We've had social media um, campaigns going on. We've been doing things at bars. Uh, but soccer is one of those sports in Birmingham that's very word of mouth. So UAB lost, but the match was a huge win for the Birmingham Hammers. Now comes the hard part. They need players, they need money, and they need a place to play. But all that, they hope, will come in time. Coming up next on Alabama Inc. You know, a lot of people say they like a lot of competition. We really don't like competition. We like to go where we're needed. In this day and age of the internet, a lot of companies are saying, sell online, don't build new stores. That's not the philosophy of Hibbit Sports and its CEO, Jeffrey Rosenthal. Here's how he got from here to there. Mr. Rosenthal, I have to start with the building that we're in right now. Have you ever run into a situation where people are kind of like, let's talk about business in a minute, okay? I, I, I want to look at the tchotchkes right now. I want to look at the souvenirs and the memorabilia. Well, you know, it's, it's, we've only been in this building about a year, and we moved from our former building, which is about a, less than a mile from here. And uh, being in the sports business, it's great to have all this memorabilia that our former CEO had. Now, I notice also that some of your offices have frosted windows, and on those windows are etched the logos of SEC teams. Have you at any point run into somebody saying, I don't want to be in the old Miss office, can you put me over in the LSU or the Alabama or anything like that? Uh, no, we haven't. You know, I'm a Florida State grad, so it was kind of hard to put all <laughs> SEC uh, um, rooms on, but we, you know, we, even the other rooms are named after um, like NCAA, Sports Center, those type things, so it's all sports themed. You know, when I was growing up in the 60s, you bought Keds or you bought Converse, and that was kind of it. And now you go to stores, whether it's, you know, Hibbit or wherever, and it's like people are paying ungodly sums of money for these shoes, a thousand different types. Where, where did all of this come from? Well, it, you know, a lot of it started, you know, really back when Michael Jordan started with Nike. Kids were starting to follow all their favorite athletes, and then they wanted to have the same shoes that that player had. And now it's become such a big industry on not just with player shoes, but it's a fashion thing and different colors and definitely different innovation and technology and those type things to make these shoes go. And, you know, we have shoes that we sell up to $200. and. Uh, $150 and $100, but it's really a lot of technology, a lot of fashion and those type things.
The conference room where we're set up here, you know, memorabilia all over the place, and off to one wall over here we have like, you know, autographed jerseys by uh, Mia Hamm, Freddie Adu, soccer players, that sort of thing. It seems though that, you know, soccer's had a hard time really kind of like, you know, latching on to the American public and American interest, that sort of thing. Do, do you think that's going to change, or is it going to be kind of like, you know, as we go forward, it's going to be foreign and folks are going to enjoy it over there, but not, not quite as much here in the U.S.? Well, I think, you know, it really depends. We really see, like, our soccer business is really young, you know, really below 10 and, and below. And, you know, we do see a little bit more at the high school level. But, um, you know, we think that soccer will continue to grow a little bit. Um, you know, it's a faster pace, you know, where we see some of the slowdown is in baseball. Not as many kids playing baseball. Lacrosse is starting to pop up in some markets. And those are really... You know, kids want fast and active type things to, uh, to get them going. But, you know, I think the World Cup it will help just give exposure to the sport. If, if you were starting up a business, you might think to yourself, you know, go to the big population areas. So you'd go to the big cities if you wanted to get a lot of shoppers. And yet your, your corporation really seems to lean toward smaller markets. Can you explain that strategy? How does that work? Well, our strategy works. We go, we go where we're needed. We go to small populations. You know, a lot of people say they like a lot of competition. We really don't like competition. We like to go where we're needed. And we may be the only game in town. We may be the only guy that carries Nike or Oakley or Under Armour or those type things. So um, kind of a different feel to it. Um, we like to be 20 to 25 minutes drive time from our competition as much as possible. So we're in a lot of small, small isolated towns like Hazard, Kentucky, Gun Barrel, Texas, a lot of really, really small towns. What challenge does that create in terms of like, like narrow casting? If you go to a city with a million people, well, you can pretty much tell what they're into, but you know, one small town to the next small town, the tastes may be different. How do you keep up with that? Our strategy is to go within a two hour drive distance. So a lot of times we understand the needs and wants of the customer. and We spend a lot of time looking at the demographics of that particular community. And we try to adapt to that community, kind of be the local sporting goods store in that. We may carry the high school teams, we'll carry colors in the particular local team. You know, if it's an orange team, we may have orange duffel bags or hats or t-shirts or those type things. I noticed a speech that you gave one time uh, just the other day, I believe it was stockholders, that uh, you talked about the number of stores that, that you were adding to the, to, the, to the chain. And it seems as though nowadays people are spending a lot of time saying, well, it's an internet world, okay? So they go online, there's less bricks and mortar, and yet you all seem to emphasize the notion of you know, of adding more stores, closing some that aren't, aren't producing a lot, but you're adding a lot too. So how do, you, how do you follow that path? Well, still a lot of these communities continue to grow populations, especially in the Sun Belt. So, you know, for instance, we'll open stores in the oil and gas states such as Texas. A lot of these towns are even the populations going. They still have high school sports in that town and, and those type things. You know, there is some business obviously being done on the internet. You know, we'll get there eventually, but there's still so much growth in these small communities just because they've been underserved for so many years. What has Walmart done to you? Really doesn't really affect us much. We like being with Walmart. Um, they don't carry any of our brands um, in, in apparel or footwear. So we really, a lot of people always, you know, especially in New York and Boston, they always say, well, how can you be next to Walmart and sell $150 shoes? Well, none of the brands um, are the same and parents tend to spend money on their kids on what they need and want you know if someone's gonna hit you know play baseball and hit a hit a ball ten more feet they're gonna spend the money and get the most innovative bat there is and you may spend three to four hundred dollars on a baseball bat we were talking earlier about your predecessor Mickey Newsom and you know his, his emphasis of all of the, uh, the the memorabilia and such you know he was here for 48 years and then you know, he moved to another role on the board. You're now the head person. How, how, how tough a transition was that? Really wasn't. You know, I've been here 15 years and, you know, we've worked together very closely and, you know, uh, it was just an evolution of what was going to come up, that was going to happen anyways. And uh, so it really been a very smooth transition. Delicately, I mean, he's still on the board. So it's, it's, it, it, would, it would, have, would it have been easier for you if he just kind of went off and played golf somewhere or, or did, you, did you rely on his, his wisdom from, you know? You know, from time to time, I'll, you know, definitely ask opinions and see what his thoughts were. But, you know, 
things are changing and, and the business continues to evolve. A couple of quick marketing questions for you here. Uh, we were talking earlier about the, the, the athletic shoes and get really expensive. Do, do you find consumers in smaller communities kind of leaning away from that and sticking more with the meat and potatoes? kind of stuff or what? Not necessarily, you know, still our best products are really are more high end. You know, the better the shoe, the better the piece of apparel or the better equipment, we sell that better than the more commodity type items. They want the newest and greatest and especially when it comes to sports and the way you look, that's what our customers are telling us. For them to run around in and right. everything. Man, that's perfect, that's wonderful. Okay. And how do you think that will take so, Mr. Rosenthal, do you have a, have a certain favorite spot among all of this that you kind of like go and go, huh, like that, you know, before you start the day? Um, I, you know, I really like a Sports Illustrated wall, which has all the Sports Illustrated, you know, that, that Mr. Newsom's collected throughout all the years. I think that's sort of pretty cool to have. You know, we were talking earlier about like, you know, some businesses leaning more toward the internet, away from bricks and mortar, and we were discussing, you know, between takes here about like, you know, how, how to utilize Instagram, Twitter, that sort of thing. How, how, have, you, have you all solved the mystery for yourselves on how to use that? Or is I don't know if we've solved the mystery. We continue to move towards mobile and social and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You know, I think that's really some of the challenges in the future. How do you, how do you capitalize on all those ways to communicate with the customers, and especially our customers, because they're usually very young and that's how they communicate. So it's very important that that we continue to build on that and learn from that and make sure we find the right people to help us do that. So you have like a room somewhere with like some 20 somethings in it and they're, they're kind of like ones figuring it out? Or what? Uh, they're the ones figuring it out and they're pretty young. <laughs> Coming up next on Alabama Inc. There are occasions where you'll have an old high school buddy. I just left the scene of a crime, <laughs> uh, I need your help. Each week on Alabama Inc., we bring in one of our show experts to talk with correspondent Josh Sneed. Our expert gives Josh a top five list, and Josh takes it from there. This week, Josh chats with Richard Burton of Burton & Associates about things to consider when you're dealing with lawyers. If you're watching this from prison, then you probably already know that all lawyers aren't created equal. In fact, we've got Richard Burton from Burton & Associates here today to give us five tips on all things we need to know when we deal with lawyers. So let's get going because we're getting billed by the app. All right, Richard Burton, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so today we're doing uh, five things you need to know when you uh, deal with a lawyer, right? Mm, right. All right, well, let's get into it. Number five, let's do it. Okay, great. Um, number five would be that uh, lawyers don't know everything about the law. Basically what I mean by that is that attorneys generally specialize in one or maybe two areas of the law. For instance, like I, I don't handle divorce. Right. I don't do divorce. I don't do criminal law. So uh, there are occasions where you'll have an old high school buddy that will come back and... I just left the scene of a crime. Yeah. Uh, I need your help. And then you kind of have to tell yeah. them that's not really my field. Yeah, I, I think that's probably very common. They know you're an attorney and so they assume that you'll be able to help them with their DUI, for instance. <laughs> Or, uh, or start, That's an interesting choice of friends you've got. <laughs> tells but, us a lot about you. Right, yeah, usually try to give some general advice until the next day when you can point them in the right direction, so to speak. All right, number four. Uh, number four is that uh, legal fees can be high, but not always. And this is a very common question, obviously, when you're meeting with clients is, how much is this going to cost? And people always want to know why are attorney's fees so high? And For uh, golf, because... Yeah, you, can, you have to work half the day and then play golf <laughs> the other half, and it, someone yeah. else has got to pay for that. So what is about the average, you would think, um, in Alabama? In the state of Alabama, on the low end, it's 150 an hour. To the high end, maybe 400 an hour. I used to work at a, a video store for $9 an hour, so <laughs> I can kind of... Yeah, it, it, it's hard for most people to relate to, especially people that even at a good job, you might make $25 an hour. Right. But uh, the thing to remember about attorney's fees is it's not all going to the attorney like any business, they have the overhead of their office, uh, they have a paralegal, a legal secretary, the actual cost of running a law firm. Very likely the lawyer might be making $10 an hour just like you. All right, that was good, that was good. So number three, let's go. All right, number three is be wary of attorneys who advertise a lot. Right, these are guys you see a lot on uh, the commercials, like bus ads, things like that. You know, again, it's not to say these are bad attorneys, but uh, for instance, a good way to, to put it is uh, every time you turn on the TV, there's a car commercial. 
just because you see Ford or Chevy advertising, you're not necessarily just going to run right out and buy a Ford or a Chevy. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to go take the car for a test drive. Also, something that's very important to remember, the person you see on TV most likely will not be the attorney that represents you. There are a few attorneys in town that are faces on a billboard. So, oh, you just made a very uh, dangerous enemy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's again, it's just... You're going to get some phone calls. Yeah, well, possibly. <laughs> uh, no, I just, I, again, it's not to say that, that those are poor lawyers or bad right. lawyers or that they those just might firms not be the are bad lawyers, but... Again, just because you see a car advertised on TV doesn't necessarily mean that's the car for you. All right, that was interesting. So uh, what do we have to our number two? Uh, number two, I would say, is a lot of lawyers never go to court. I think this is a big misconception with the public. Is you right. think, uh, we picture you all in white suits, Perry Mason style. Yeah, law and order. Badgering the witness. Right. So you're a wills and trust guy for the most part, right? Yeah. How much do you actually spend time in court? Uh, rarely. Really? Yeah, rarely. Much of what I do is, is you planning. You regret that, though? I mean, did you want to <laughs> put that white suit on? Yeah, it's <laughs> no, exciting. <I'm> <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Number one. Let's I'd say the number one tip would be that good lawyers specialize. Okay. And basically what I mean by that is that you're, you're going to focus on one or two areas of practice. And, and again, there's just, there's just too much to know to, to practice in multiple areas. Right. And so generally speaking, you're going to meet with an attorney and they may or may not be able to help you with your particular issue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but hopefully they know someone who they can refer you to. There's a lot of information out there, people's websites and, and things like that that you can check out first. You educate yourself as you would if you were purchase, making any other purchase. Okay, all right. Well, that's all five things to know when uh, dealing with lawyers. I made it through all five without making any lawyer jokes. <laughs> you should appreciate that. Uh. I did that for you. All right, well, thank you. That's our show for this week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, keep up with the stories we're working on, and tell us what you think. I'm Gigi Duban, and we'll see you next time on Alabama Inc.